He's risen. risen Like Neil said, the title of our sermon this morning is The Tale of Two Trees. These aren't two ordinary trees. In fact, these are the two most important trees in the world. And, And these trees tell us about the most fundamental, foundational purposes, about the meaning of life, about why you are here, and about who you are. I'm going to tell you about the first tree, and the reason we're going to start with the first tree is is if you don't understand the first tree, you're never really going to understand the second tree. When I was growing up, my grandpa had a little vegetable garden in his backyard, and he had a sign in the vegetable garden that said, life began in a garden. And it's true because Genesis 2.8 says, the Lord God planted a garden toward the east in Eden, and there he placed the man whom he had formed. This is the most famous garden in the world. It's not like a little vegetable garden. It's more like maybe an English garden or a French garden or a Japanese garden, right? This expansive area that has been laid out and designed, not only to grow plants, but to grow people and relationships. You see, these kinds of gardens have water features and bridges and sitting areas. While they are meant to grow plants, they're also meant for relationship, for people to grow. That's the kind of garden that Eden was. It was a place for man and woman to walk with God, to commune with him, and to deepen their relationship with him. The Westminster Catechism, a catechism is a a theological teaching that starts with a question and an answer. And the Westminster Catechism is the most famous catechism in Protestantism. And the very first question in the Westminster Catechism says, what is the chief end of man? And the answer is, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. What is our purpose? Why are we here? Well, these guys, according to these theologians, it's to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That's what God created us for, to glorify him and to enjoy him. In the very next verse, though, we find out something very important about this garden that God had created for him and man and women. It says in Genesis 2, 9, out of the ground, the Lord God caused to grow every tree that is pleasing to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See, in the garden of Eden, there were two trees, the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. These two trees represented two different paths for mankind. It represented a choice Not just for Adam and Eve, but for all of their descendants. The tree of life represented the life that God had intended for Adam and Eve. Eternal life, free from death, free from sin, free from sickness. A life of loving intimacy walked out in faith with their creator, their father. A life of abundance, of never being in want, of being satisfied by God who gladly would share all that he has with us. God's desire and will was that men and women would eat from that tree and walk in fellowship with him. But it says there's a second tree there, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the tree that I want to highlight here this morning. It's the first tree in the tale of two trees, the tree that God had forbidden them from eating from. It represented a different path. It represented a path away from God, a path defined by self-determination, by self-will, and ultimately by self-destruction. God said this in Genesis 2, 15 through 17, the Lord God took the man, he put him in the garden of Eden to cultivate it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, from any tree of the garden you may eat freely, but from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat from it you will surely die. Now one of the questions that automatically should occur to us is Why is this tree even there in the first place? If this tree represents such a destructive path away from God, why would God even allow this tree to grow? Why would God himself put that tree in the middle middle of the garden? Well, I think there's a few different answers to that, but I think the best answer is this, is that if that tree wasn't there, there could never be any real authentic love. Now, here's why. If if all there was, there was never any opportunity to reject God. There was never any opportunity to go our own way. 
You, you think about the garden. The whole garden was full of freedom. The whole garden, you, there, was, there was no rules. You could do whatever it is you wanted. There was just one simple rule. Don't eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. But that tree represented a choice. You see, apart from choice, we just would be simply be animatronic robots working out a, a pre-programmed script. And so that tree represented an, an option for us. God does not want us to be slaves to him, forced into submission. But he wants us to walk in, in glad relationship with him, choosing him. And so that's why he put that tree there. That tree was a choice that we could go our own way if we desired. You know, we're not told how long it is that Adam and Eve are in the garden before we get to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3, we all know the story. It says, Now the serpent was more crafty than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? The woman said to the serpent, From the fruit of the trees of the garden we may eat, but from the fruit of the tree which is in the middle of the garden, God has said you shall not eat from it or touch it or you will die. The serpent said to the woman, You surely will not die. For God knows that in the day you eat from it, your eyes will be opened and you will become like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was desirable to make one wise, she took from its fruit and ate. And she gave also to her husband with her and he ate. It was at that moment, that first bite, that Eve fell into sin. And the second bite, Adam fell into sin. And with them, actually, all of humanity fell into sin. The Bible, or theologians call this the fall. A fall from perfection. A fall from grace. A fall into death. You know, Adam and Eve, they didn't die that day. But the process of them dying began. From that moment that they ate of the tree, their bodies began to decay. Their bodies began to break down and grow old. Every single person since Adam and Eve has been born in with that same sickness, that same bent, that same brokenness. Sinful nature. For all of us, it comes very natural. All of us have sinned against God. What God had created to be good and beautiful has become marred by sin. And nothing's been left untouched. You know, you can look into the world and you can see God's fingerprints all over it. You can still see God's good design, but the world is not as it was intended to be. Because while you can see that good design, it's never far behind the brokenness and the corruption of sin. Sin has marred God's good creation. Bodies that have been designed to live forever are now plagued by disease, fatigue, and brokenness. My son recently got a skateboard. And it is obvious that there are certain times in life when you can ride a skateboard and certain times when you cannot. That time has passed for me. <laughs> I am old. My bones are brittle. Do you remember when you used to fall and just get back up? Now, if you fall, you're like, am I okay? You have to like check all your parts, you know, like make sure everything's okay. Did I rupture my spleen? You know, if we hadn't fallen, we would still be dropping in at the skate park with our kids. But as it is, we have to hope that we can go through the night without having to get out of bed and pee a few times. <laughs> That's the fall. That's bodies corrupted by sin. The perfect paradise that God had prepared for us to walk in unbroken fellowship and harmony with him and with each other is no longer there. The, grand, the ground now would produce thorns and thistles, natural dis disasters and dangerous snakes, diseases and microbes. The unity between brothers and sisters and husbands and wives would no longer be the natural state, but things would become hard-earned and fraught and corrupted. Jealousy, envy, strife, pride, hatred, greed, lust are all too common temptations. We would all suffer the consequences of the sin of others that they would commit against us, and others would suffer the sins, suffer the consequences of sins that we commit against them. 
But the worst thing of all that happened in the fall, the thing that precipitates all the other sins, is that we no longer can enjoy the oneness relationship with God where we just walk in the garden in the cool of the day, free from the shame of sin. Just enjoying them is no longer an option. In some sense, we had unplugged ourselves from God and we had plugged ourselves into the tree of life. I'm sorry, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Represented going our own way, making our own choices. And listen, let's be real. I've been talking about this in very general terms, like all of us, but every single person in here, you personally understand what it is to walk in rebellion against God. All of us have sinned in big ways and all of us have sinned in many small ways. And all of us have been, have been struck by, if you've been paying attention, the numbness, the depression, the loneliness, the hopelessness. We try to hide it. We try to numb those things with, with our phones or with relationships or with pouring ourselves into our career or busying ourselves with all the things of life. And yet it's like pouring things into a, a bottomless pit. It never fully satisfies in some real way, as they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, death entered into the world. And all of us have been shut up into a tomb, a tomb that we can't escape from, a tomb that we have no hope in escaping from, utterly stuck, unable to help ourselves. That's the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And that's the destructive fruit that came with it. Now, if that was the end of the story, all would be hopeless. Eating from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil took away our life in God. It headed us towards death, both physically and spiritually. It separated us from God through our own sin, and it destined us to destruction. But... This is not the tale of one tree, is it? This is the tale of two trees. See, after they ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, everything changed. They, they could not come back to God. They had no relationship with him. Everything that was perfect was now tainted. And no amount of work that they could do would ever bring them back to that closeness and that perfection and that wholeness that they had with God. The chasm was just far too wide. You couldn't work hard enough. You couldn't determine yourself hard enough to, to be close with him, to build that relationship back. You couldn't even decide like, I've only sinned this much. Other people have sinned this much. It was far too wide of a chasm for us to fix. I, I think about it like this. Like Michael Phelps and I, and I think about Michael Phelps and I all the time. Michael Phelps, as you guys know, is, is the greatest swimmer that has ever lived, I believe. And, and it, it's interesting about his body. Well, he is... He is practice forever. He has trained since he was a little kid, broke records when he was a little kid. His body is actually shaped differently. His arms are longer than they're supposed to be for the body that he has. His hands are huge. He basically has flippers. His feet are double jointed. So his, his kick actually goes to the angle of that of a dolphin. He, he was made to swim. And then you have me. I'm all right. <laughs> I got a mean doggy paddle, I'll tell you that. I, I swam at, for a, a class in college and I remember my college professor saying, man, swimmers make the, I mean, surfers make the worst swimmers. So I quit that class because I don't need that negativity in my life. But <laughs> listen, if you line me and Michael Phelps on the beach in PB and you tell both of us swim to Hawaii, I might get a mile and then die. He might get 100 miles and die, but there is absolutely no way that either of us will ever, ever, ever be able to make it to Hawaii. It doesn't matter how much training he had. It's the same thing. It doesn't matter how much work that you give. That tree took away our right to the Father, and we could not have it back. It was an impossible gap to make, but Jesus bridged that gap and gave us a new tree. And that new tree, he redeemed us from the payment of the first tree. And he gave us the right to live in the grace of the second tree. 
I wanna read you a scripture. Let's find out what that second tree is. First Peter 2, 24 says this. It says, he, Jesus, himself bore our sins. Say my sins. This is important. He's not talking about the sins of 2,000 years ago. He's talking about all the sins that were ever committed, were committed, and would ever be committed. When he says Jesus himself bore our sins, he means my sins, and he means your sins, in his body on the tree that we may die to sin and live to righteousness because by his wounds we have been made we have been healed. So what was the the second tree? What was the tree that Peter was talking about? The second tree in the tale of two trees, it's this, it's the tree of the cross. Now the tree of the cross is the exact opposite of the first tree. They They are polar opposites. Where one tree brought death, the other brought life. Where one tree brought hardship and anguish, the other tree brought joy and fullness. Where one tree brought weakness, the other brought strength outside of ourselves. Where one tree gave us hopelessness, the tree of the cross gave us hope. Where one tree separated us, it brought us separation. The other tree brought us redemption. See, the problem that the first tree created was that we unplugged from God and we plugged into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which is just the tree of of wanting to be our own God. It's the tree of our own selfishness that I'll do life on my own. I don't need God. And when we plugged into that, we broke our connection. But Jesus gave us the second tree to fix the problem of the first tree so that we could unplug from ourselves or that tree and plug back into God and his power and his help and his peace and his comfort. We didn't have to do it on our own. Now, let me, let me make sure we understand something. The power is not in the tree, is it? It's not in the cross, but the power is what happened upon that cross. What we celebrate for Easter is this, is that 2,000 years, some 2,000 years ago, Jesus came to earth and he was crucified for our sins upon that cross and he died and he was buried in the tomb. Death thought they won. The enemy thought that he won. He, the, 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 the demon world was having a celebration. They thought he won, but how many of you guys know that death could, cannot hold him down? Because when they came back, three days later, they found that the tomb was no longer shut. Stay there, please. That the tomb was no longer shut And there was no one inside because he had risen. Amen? Amen. Listen, when he rose, this was his resurrection that gave us redemption. When Jesus rose, he conquered death, he overcame sin, and he gave us the right to come back to him. God knew all the impossibilities that sin brought. He knew that apart from him, there was no lasting peace. There's no lasting wholeness. There's no lasting joy. He made us to need him. It's what he did. And we will always feel like something is missing in our lives because what is missing is him. You know, you can do life on your own. I don't know, in a crowd like this, I don't know how many of us in here have been doing life on our own. If we were to be real, we've been plugged into the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We've been plugged into our own selfishness, our own wants and our own desires, and we have become our own God. And you can do life like that. And you can try to find peace. And you can try to find comfort. And you can try to find wholeness. But you'll never find lasting peace. Lasting peace is only found in Jesus. Lasting wholeness is only found in in Jesus, because he is the one thing that we need. He is the one thing that misses, that we would be missing. But God wants to give all of us access back to him. God sent his son to die for our sins so that we can unplug and we can plug back into him. Look, whether you know it or not, 
I don't know what area in life that you're in here. If, you're, if you came with someone, or you're here for the first time. But I'll tell you this. You have a God in heaven that loves you dearly, that wants to have a relationship with you, that wants to give you his help and his power, and he wants to separate you from the slavery that this world tries to bind us in. I wanna read you a scripture. It's Romans 6, verse 23. It says, for the wages of sin is death. That tree led to the sin of death, the wages of our sin. It, it kills us, not just physically, but spiritually. That's why we have all of these problems, all of these issues. That's why half the world, or more than half the world, is just lonely, and they're in despair. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And I'm gonna tell you this, it's not just eternal life when we die, we go to heaven. It's eternal life here right now. It is the help and power of God over us. My dad, he was a, a alcoholic, burned out alcoholic. You met him in the 70s, he, he was hopeless. He lived in despair. He had hardship everywhere. He, he would say that he was sorry he was even born. The despair over his life was so great. He was a, a beach bum living down at the beach. Dave, his brother, my uncle, same thing. He was a drugged out hippie living for himself, plugged into this tree. He had, he had messed his mind up so much on drugs that he was in, under the care of a psychiatrist medicated. He was paranoid. He was afraid of everything. But even when they were fully in their own sin, can I tell you that God had a plan for them? Even when they were fully in their sin, fully lost, God had a plan for them. And I will tell you this, God has a plan for you as well, no matter where you are in your sin. He has a plan. Let me tell you, Mark and Dave, that's, that's my dad and my uncle. They both came at different times to realize the power that God had, had, had wanted to give them, that he loved them, and they, they both gave their lives to Christ, and everything changed. My dad, his alcohol addiction was gone, and in that moment, he felt the power of God. In fact, he said this, he was at a concert, and the guy was preaching, and, and in that moment, he gave his life to God, and he thought... It, he had it wrong for so long. He thought that, that being a Christian is all the things you have to give up. But he said in that moment, clarity hit him. It's not about what you give up. It's about what you get. You get Jesus living with you. And his life changed forever. And Dave's life changed forever. And they became the two founding pastors of this church. Everywhere you look, their fingerprints are on it. Look, you look around the people, their fingerprints are on us because God had a plan and his plan for them was in this cross and his plan for you is in this cross. John 10.10 10 is a scripture. And I love this because it just paints this perfect picture. It says, the thief has come to steal and kill and destroy. That is the purpose of the thief, of the enemy, of the serpent, that plugged us into that tree. Look, at, if, if you know something, the enemy wants to steal your life, he wants to kill your soul, and he wants to destroy everything you have. That's what he does. And as long as we're plugged into that tree, he can do that. But it says, I, Jesus, came that you may have life and have it abundantly. That is why Jesus came. Listen, if you are in here and you do not know Jesus, I want you to know this. The enemy wants to steal from you, but Jesus wants to give you an abundant life, a life that you've been wanting. It's what he does because he loves you. He says, like, let's, let's have the um, worship team come up. He says, and he says it like this. God says back in the Old Testament, he says, and this is for every single one of us, whether you're a Christian or not, this, this, it can mean two different things. But, but if you haven't given your life to the Lord, the Bible says this, I've placed before you life and death, the blessing or the curse. So choose life that you may live. Look, I'm just gonna tell you right now, every single one of us have choices in life. Everyone of us has choices right now. If, if you have walked away from God, or if you've never given your life to God, you have a choice right now. What are you gonna choose? 
life or death, the blessing or the curse. You're gonna get one. We're already connected. We start in life connected to this tree. We have to choose this tree. Maybe today is your choice. The Bible says is this. It says that Jesus stands at the door of our hearts and he knocks. Anybody who will open up the door that he will come and live with them and he will be their Lord and he will be their source of help. I have to believe this, that in a, in a crowd like this, there's many of us that have, have walked away from God or never given our lives to the Lord, but right now, we're under the power and presence of the Holy Spirit. That right now, the presence of God is working on you, and you can feel it. You feel this different peace that you don't normally do, and you know right now that God is, Jesus is calling your name, and you have a choice. In a, in a minute, we're going to invite people to come up to respond to God. And I want to tell you right now a special call to you that this is your time, that you get to choose Jesus and he gets to come in and be the help that you so badly need. It's here today. It's a free gift. It doesn't cost you. You don't have to write a check for it. It's a free gift. You come up. And, and you can stand up here. There's going to be lots of people standing up here. I'll explain it. And, and, and you can stand and as one of our prayer and ministry team come and pray with you, you just say, I want to give my life to Christ. And they will walk you through a prayer. Today can be your day. It's your choice. But remember, the enemy has come to steal, kill, and destroy. And he's going to be working on you right this moment. He doesn't want you to give your life to God. He will try to give you every reason not to. Block him out. Act in boldness. Walk out what you know God needs you to do. Don't let him steal any longer. Evict him today. Let's stand up right now. Now, this is the most important part of any service that Foothills does. It's a time where we get to respond to God and, and, and you can respond to God for any need you may have. Look at some of us in here, has nothing to do with salvation. We're good and saved, but we need God to come in and heal something inside of us. God is the God of healing. It's what he does. And you might have a disease, you might have cancer, you might have a broken something. I always encourage you, come up and ask God for healing. Maybe it's not a physical thing. Maybe it's a, uh, something else. You just need your marriage. You need fixing your marriage. You need God's hand in it or in raising your kids or in your business. I want to encourage you, come in and get prayer. You can either stand up here and a prayer and prayer and ministry team will pray with you or you can kneel down at this kneeling bench and you can do business with God on your own. No one will bother you. But don't let the enemy steal from you either. You know, I know there's people that are trying to get pregnant and can't. Come pray that God would put new life inside of your womb. It's what he does. So in a second, we're going to start worshiping. And we're going to open up this area. If you want the supernatural power of God to come into your natural life, then we got to ask him. He says, you have not because you ask not. I want to encourage you to come up here. And I also want to say this. If you don't know the Lord and you want to unplug from that tree and you want to plug into this tree, Jesus desires that for you as well. Don't miss this chance. Come up and get prayer. Let's worship and you guys can start coming up right now.